Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio, 250 plus markets across the United States of America, and of course, ESPN Radio on Sirius XM, Channel 80. Number to call up as always is 888-729-3776. That's 888-SAY-ESPN. It's time for Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. We all know what time it is today. I understand that Super Bowl 52 is upon us, less than two weeks away, a rematch of what took place in Super Bowl 39 between the Philadelphia Eagles and the New England Patriots. There's a lot of stuff to get into. I understand that. I understand we got to get into Des Bryant. Tweets from T.O. The Cowboys somehow, some way have made news. And you've got people talking about that. I get all of that. Basketball front, Jason Kidd's five. We got to talk about that. Basketball front, Damian Lillard has a meeting with owner, Mr. Allen, Paul Allen. We got to talk about that. But we all know what the story of the day is. It's the drama, the soap opera, General Hospital, or Young and the Wrestler style. Pick your spot. It's the soap opera stuff that's going on within the organization of the Cleveland Cavaliers. According to numerous reports, NBA insider extraordinaire Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN, my colleague here. He will be on with us, by the way, in about 27 minutes. But he's one of the people that wrote the story about how the Cleveland Cavaliers had a meeting and everybody went in on Kevin Love. And our folks weren't happy with Kevin Love. Why could you possibly have a problem with Kevin Love? It's very, very simple. Love, they felt, didn't give them any love. Because while the Cleveland Cavaliers was in the midst of getting spanked, ramrodded, beat down, embarrassed by the Oklahoma City Thunder, scoring, by the way, 124 points on Saturday afternoon and still losing by 24, they gave up damn near 150 points, 148 to be exact. Because the Cleveland Cavaliers did that and they were getting spanked, they had a problem because after the game, they came into the locker room, and guess what? Kevin Love was already gone. Kevin Love had left the game and was home chilling. He left. He left. He was home, and they felt like he just left them there hanging. In their eyes, even in the eyes of somebody like LeBron James, who gets along very, very well with Kevin Love from what I'm told, even in the eyes of somebody like him, it's the equivalent of getting into a street fight with one of your boys and then you leave your boys and desert everybody. That's how everybody was looking at Kevin Love. Let me tell you how you should be looking at Kevin Love. If you want to look at that, because I like Kevin Love. And I happen to believe that Kevin Love is the second best player on the Cleveland, in the Cleveland Cavaliers, and he's the second most reliable player on the Cleveland Cavaliers. I think Kevin Love has been a walking double-double. I think for the most part, he shows up and produces. I think that, believe it or not, he finds himself in an untenable situation. And I'm going to go places that most people ain't going to go. Damn it, because I can. Kevin Love, being a baller, who happens to be white, might have a problem being around these brothers. With the problems that they have, and not a brother, you don't care about that. I'm talking about these particular brothers with all the drama circulating in Cleveland. You got LeBron James that don't want to commit to a long-term deal. You got Isaiah Thomas that's looking to get paid and trying to find his bearings after being out with the hip injury. You got J.R. Smith who's trying to remember how to be a shooting guard. You got Tristan Thompson who's associated with the Kardashians. And I'm not being disrespectful. I'm not getting into his personal business. But the Kardashian curse is something that has been talked about on numerous occasions. And the reality of the situation is he hasn't played that well. Now, in my mind, Tristan Thompson is a role player who has been a starter, and he's a reserve trying to learn how to be a reserve, and that's problematic. And caught in the midst of all of that is a coach in Tyron Lue who's been a sacrificial lamb, a GM who's a rookie for an owner who thinks he knows more basketball than the players. And when you combine that with the fact that LeBron James is entering the last year of his deal and he's free to leave this summer, and he didn't want Kyrie traded because he didn't like the deal for Isaiah Thomas and Jamie Crowder and those boys, and you couple all of that with the fact that Dan Gilbert said, okay, if that's what you want, they commit to me long term, three to five years, and I'll keep Kyrie. But if you're not going to do that, I'm going to look towards the future. I'm not going to think about you. I'm going to think about life beyond you because I'm going to anticipate that you're leaving. And LeBron said, so be it. Do what you got to do. 
So all of that going on just makes for the drama. Just makes for the drama that exists. That's what happens. Now we can sit up there and say, well, we're not going to cast blame or we're going to cast blame to this player to that player. J.R. Smith's got to shoot better. I don't want to hear any complaints about Dwayne Wade. He's a three-time champion, a future Hall of Famer who was more than willing to go to the bench because obviously that will help J.R. get his confidence back. I don't want to hear about Kevin Love because he is what we thought he was. He can shoot. He can rebound. That's what he does. And we all know it. Stop it if you're trying to say otherwise. Tristan Thompson, he's got to play better, but he is a role player. Isaiah Thomas, look, he is what he is. The brother can score. And when healthy, he could average 20 to 25 a game. And when healthy, he's a scoring dynamo. But he's miniature. As a result, he can't defend most people in the NBA because he's not some Muggsy Bogues type that's pressuring the ball 94 feet. He's got to defend in a half-court setting. And most, if not everybody in the NBA, can shoot over him. That's a problem. He's strong as a pit bull, but he's short. And as a result, he's limited defensively, which doesn't help with the Cleveland Cavaliers because unlike Golden State, the Cleveland Cavaliers don't do a great job of covering one another defensively. And we didn't even get into all of the agendas. You got J.R. wanting to be a starter and a bit salty because he bust his tail in the offseason to work himself into being as good as he could possibly be, in part anyway, to appease LeBron. And then the minute Dwayne Wade came, he felt like he was on the outside looking in. That was a problem. You got the combination of him and guys like Iman Shumpert. Some people feel getting paid too much. I got love for both of them. I think they do their jobs. So you got that going on. You got Isaiah Thomas who deserves his money, but might not deserve it from this particular franchise. Tyron Lue's job may be in jeopardy. And of course, you got the rookie GM and court. They're all caught in the middle of LeBron and Dan Gilbert being on the outs with one another again. I mean, what an absolute mess it is in Cleveland, Ohio with this basketball team. You just can't make it up. You just can't make it up. 888-729-3776 is the number to call up. This 888-729-3776. 888-SAY-ESPN. The other item I'm going to get into is Jason Kidd being fired. Ladies and gentlemen, the team wasn't achieving as much as it should. With the Greek freak, with Brogdon, with Bledsoe and others, maybe they should have been better. But my God, you can't give it time. You can't give it time. Just going to get rid of Jason Kidd, just like that. I don't think it's right. But it's perfectly within Milwaukee's prerogative to do what they're doing. Here's what I really have a problem with. Jason Kidd's lost his job. Fisdale and and Memphis has lost his job. Watson and Phoenix has lost his job. Ladies and gentlemen, when you look at the African-American coaches that exist, the Doc Rivers, the Tyron Lues of the world, the J.B. Bickerstaffs with his interim tag. Ladies and gentlemen, at the rate things are going, by the end of this season, there may only be two black coaches in the entire NBA. Dwayne Casey in Toronto, who's one of the most fabulous coaches in the league, And, of course, Nate McMillan in Indiana. Everybody else might be gone. Tyron Lue might be gone. Doc Rivers might be gone. J.B. Bickerstaff might be gone. I mean, what the hell is going on here? You got numbers crunches and analytics dudes who are friends with other analytics dudes. Evidently, none who happen to be black. Basically invading the NBA by ingratiating themselves with owners who understand numbers better than they understand the game and are more than willing to give those folks an opportunity that they're not going to accord to other people. There is something wrong going on here, and I'm going to tell you what's wrong. Where the hell are all of these black players speaking up about this issue? Where's the support? We want to speak against the president. We want to speak about social issues. We want to come to the end, to the, to, to, to the defense of things that may have nothing to do with us. We want to use our Twitter and Facebook and Instagram accounts. But when it comes to the issue of black coaches and the challenges that they face in a league that's over 70% black, we haven't heard a damn word from these players. 
And I'm not counting LeBron and D-Wade speaking up for Fisdale because Fisdale was an assistant coach in Miami. That's one of their boys. And I appreciate their support, but that's just support from the peanut gallery. They, you know, that's your man. And you giving him love. I'm talking about the issue of the dissipating number of African-American coaches in a sport of basketball. This ain't the National Hockey League or Major League Baseball. This is basketball. And cats who never played, but no numbers, are taking over this league. And the Fred Hoybergs in Chicago, and the Dave Yeagers in Sacramento, and the Brett Browns in Philadelphia and others keeping their jobs. While African-American coaches are falling by the wayside. No one has a problem with that? You're a black NBA player, you have nothing? You have nothing to say about that? Nothing. Nothing. But you got time to talk about the president or something else. But not this issue, huh? Hmm. Okay. I'm not black. I'm OJ. Okay. 888-729-3776. say espn Straight Talk Wireless. Nationwide coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. In case you didn't notice. I'm just getting started. I got a whole bunch of energy today. Oh, I can't wait. I got to I'm mad. We got to go to commercial. You are listening live to the Stephen A. Smith show on ESPN radio. By the way, buckle up. I'm just getting started. I'm a robot vacuum cleaner. So, yeah, I got one gig. I suck up dirt. So pardon my inferiority complex about GEICO, who does so much more. Like, not only could they save their customers money on car insurance, but they got fast and friendly claim service, too. And an award-winning mobile app. Plus access to licensed agents 24-7. Who am I kidding? I can't even do corners. Uh Uh-oh. Choking hazard. (sighs) Popcorn girdles. GEICO. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show Podcast. See, nobody wants to go here. Nobody wants to go here. I'm, I'm, I will be the first to admit it. I don't know why the hell ESPN decided to give me a national radio show, but I'm thankful. And guess what? I ain't giving it back. I'm telling you that right now. Because it's moments like this that I was made for radio. See, I ain't scared to touch on these issues. This is some nonsense. And white America, don't you worry. It ain't your fault. Ain't nobody pointing the finger at you. Nobody's pointing the finger at you. You got to put on your big boy pants. You got to put on your big boy pants. When I sat up there, I'm going to tell you a little story real quick. Years ago, I had a television show. Name of the television show was quite frankly. This is long before First Take became number one. Long before everybody recognized First Take as a blockbuster hit. I had a show called Quite Frankly. I got news for y'all, ladies and gentlemen. Quite frankly, it was a pretty damn good show. Pretty damn good show. Had every guest imaginable but Tiger Woods and Michael Jordan. And Michael Jordan was on his way. Ratings even went up. But here's the reality. ESPN decided they needed to go in a different direction. Ladies and gentlemen, pull my quotes from back then in 2007. Do you remember what I said? They made the right decision. Because we can sit up here and front all we want to. But when you're in the world of television, it's about ratings and it's about revenue. And guess what? The revenue, the ratings fell short. And you know why it fell short? Because a whole bunch of African-Americans, a whole bunch of black folks out there that so desperately wanted an African-American to have a show, got it. And didn't support it. That's not the company's fault. Why am I telling that story? Because as we sit here today, while some people want to lament the fact that you got African-American coaches falling by the wayside in a league over 70 percent black of players, you got coaches falling by the wayside. You only got one African-American owner. That's Michael Jordan. Who has Steve Clifford as his coach, who's not African-American, but that's a different story for another day. That's not Michael Jordan's fault. 
He's given other blacks opportunities. He hires blacks all the time. But what I'm saying is not just that, but you look at the rest of the league. There's no black ownership. And owners, rightfully so, are concerned about their bottom line. And if you meet up with young white dudes that know numbers and know how to maximize your product revenue wise, you're going to pay attention to them and they're going to hire friends. So the only the last line of defense to save the prevalence of African-American coaches in the sport of the NBA is for players to speak up. You got time to talk about the president and what he is and is not doing, but you ain't got time to talk about this issue when this is more in your wheelhouse. You want to talk about the violence in the streets and how we should be doing something about it without highlighting exactly what should be done when we all know damn well what should be done? Really? Before I go off even further about this, Let me re-air for you what I did on ESPN's first take this morning. My final take. It's pertaining to this exact same issue. I would deeply appreciate it if you would indulge me by listening to my final take on first take today. Play that, cat. You might not feel this way, but something amazing has been happening in the NBA. You might have missed it. NBA players actually know how to keep quiet. They may not know how to keep quiet over protest issues, issues involving the president of the United States of America or other social issues where it would be impossible to aim criticism in their direction because, well, criticism can't possibly come your way when you're willing to take a position almost anyone with sense would take. See the 2016 SBs, will you? But here's the thing. When it comes to the dismissal of black NBA coaches, the dwindling numbers that are appearing before our very eyes, where is all the noise of support from black players? Yes, I know that both LeBron James and Dwayne Wade echoed words of support for David Fisdale when he was axed in Memphis. But I'm not talking about obvious support from the peanut gallery, the kind that can easily be dismissed due to personal relationships. I'm alluding to the bigger issue of black coaches being pushed out of a tolerance level that has vastly lowered where they're concerned and how it's been enabled by a body of NBA players who seem unwilling or flat out scared to speak out against this alarming trend. Make whatever case you want to justify this, Dale Ert Watson in Phoenix, or now Jason Kidd in Milwaukee getting fired. But how is it that barely a word is uttered when white contemporaries who get to keep their jobs? Fred Hoiberg is still employed in Chicago, earning $5 million a year. Scott Brooks is in the nation's capital, earning an average of $7 million per, with his wizards underachieving. Dave Yeager has a job in Sacramento, paying him $4 million per year, in case y'all missed it. And Brett Brown is in the midst of an extension in Philadelphia, despite having a 97 and 274 record. Do y'all get the point? No, I'm not calling for folks to be fired. Not any of them, because there are mitigating circumstances that warrant consideration and understanding. What I'm asking is simple. How in the hell can a league where more than 70 percent of its players are African-American have barely anything to say at all about the diminished number of black coaches. Where the hell is your voice now? The way things are looking, by the end of the season, the only black coaches we suspect will have head coaching jobs will be Dwayne Casey in Toronto and Nate McMillan in Indiana. Outside of that, we don't know about Mark Jackson, about David Fisdale, even about Monty Williams, whether any of them will get a second chance. Where are the black players on that issue? That's what I'm asking. I think it's an appropriate question, especially on a day like today, following Jason Kidd's firing, when the star player who stepped up on his behalf happens to be from Greece. You heard me. Think about that for a second. And embrace yourself for when I get back. Because like I said, I'm just getting started. More to Stephen A. Smith show on ESPN Radio in a minute. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. Three minutes past hour. Number one back here on the Stephen A. Smith show ESPN Radio. I got more coming. I got more coming. But I'm going to pause 
on that particular subject that I was addressing about NBA coaches and speak to the man on the NBA, the insider extraordinaire. <clears throat> I'm proud to call him a colleague. He's been doing it up for many, many years as an elite insider on the National Basketball Association. I'm talking about my buddy, the one and only Adrian Wojnarowski. What's going on, buddy? How you doing, Woj? Steven, I'm great. Thanks it, for, uh, it's it's an honor to be in the studio. It's the first time we're in studio together, Woj. I love it. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Listen, this let's is, get right. This is big time. No question. Thanks to you. <laughs> let, let, let's get right to it because obviously you broke the story about the drama going on in, in Cleveland. So just encapsulate it for us all. They get blown out from Oklahoma by Oklahoma City Saturday. Somehow they score 124 points and still manage to lose by 24, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is just a rarity in NBA annals. What happened with Kevin Love and the Cavaliers right after? Well, Love left the game sick and left the arena before the game was over. Mm-hmm. Um, then missed team went home, did not go to Sunday's practice, said he was ill. And then when he showed up on Monday... And this was an issue. The two days he was he had left the arena, then that Sunday, I know this was a point of discussion among the team. And then when he came back uh, before practice on Monday in Cleveland, there was a team meeting. Um, players wanted to confront not only him on this, I'm told, but management, the coaching staff, asking if they were holding him accountable for what they felt was, did he bail on us? And so they... It got emotional. It got loud in there, I'm told. And, you know, like I've said this earlier today, like there is a culture of finger pointing in Cleveland Mm -hmm. and it goes around the locker room. It goes to coaches. It goes to ownership, front office. There's always a lot of blame to go around, especially even when things are going well, but, Mm -hmm. but especially when they're not. And so like it is Kevin Love in the blender these last few days. What did Kevin Love say in his own defense? Do you know that? I think he tried to make the case to people that he, he wasn't well. And uh, I, I think that there's, you know, I think there was some sense of that guys may try to accept it. I think there were some who were not accepting of whatever was going on with them, what they perceived to be the issue. Um, but um, there's just a lot of, you know, all these things with Cleveland and about, can they turn the switch on? Can the group get back together? And here, here's the difference between they don't have Kyrie Irving anymore. Mm-hmm. They are a diminished team. This is not the same team. That trade, you know, that trade did not strengthen them in other ways to make the loss comparable. They lost a superstar player, and we can go around all these other things. That's at the crux of this. They're not good enough right now. Mm. We're talking to Adrian Wojnarowski right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Let's get deeper into this from this perspective. I made the argument before the season began, or actually when the trade took place, I was told that LeBron told Dan Gilbert, I'd rather go with the horses that we have. Don't trade Kyrie. Not for this deal with Isaiah Crowder and others. Dan Gilbert wanted a three- to five-year commitment. LeBron said, no, that's not what's going to happen. And the belief is that since that time, LeBron has his agenda. He's trying to play, <clears throat> capture another championship. Then he might leave. Dan Gilbert's mentality is, I'm not committing to anything long term. As long as you're not committed. I'm not I'm not committed to doing anything for you long term. Mm-hmm. If you're not willing to mm-hmm. commit here long term, how accurate is that depiction? Based well, on what you I, I, I think... Um, all the things you said, the, the one thing that I'm not sure about that you said there, and I think it's all very um, accurate, and I'm not saying this isn't accurate, sure. but I am not positive that LeBron told him, I don't want you to do that Boston trade. I don't know that um, he may have, but I, I don't know that. But certainly ownership wanted a commitment. He wasn't willing to give it, and now they're in a position where they want to, LeBron wants the best chance he can have to win with this current team, and the best chance he has is for them to trade that Brooklyn pick that Cleveland has, and they are they are more than reluctant to trade it. Like they're only going to move it, you know. Like Paul George is a player that would would inspire them to move it. I'm told. Mm-hmm. Well, Paul George isn't available, and I don't think he's going to become available mm-hmm. to deadline, and or a really good young player on his rookie contract, and those guys don't become right. available. So um, they're going to hedge their they're going to hedge their bets in Cleveland right now mm-hmm. on their future because 
if LeBron's going to leave, they're not going to turn that pick into somebody who could just be a rental. One could have argued that if LeBron decides to get up and leave, you still would have had Kyrie, who had two years left on this deal. So why move him? Why did Dan Gilbert move Kyrie Irving? Why did he capitulate to Kyrie's wishes? It's a good question. I think that they didn't want, I think they were very concerned about that the deterioration of the relationship between Kyrie and LeBron and then Kyrie and the organization, that it would just be, there would have been too much drama. I don't think they wanted to live with the drama that would have played out. Now, they may have won and they may have figured out, and I think Ty Lue was fine with them. I think Ty Lue's attitude was, I'll coach these guys. Like, just, but I think in the end, they felt like, um, Moving Kyrie, moving Kyrie spared them yeah. the the circus and training camp. They didn't want to go through it anymore there. And was it the right decision, the wrong one? It was. I don't think they had the stomach for, um, like those two going at it all year. Adrian, we hear so much about so much speculation about whether Le- LeBron is going to stay or go, based on what you're seeing, combined with what you have heard. Is this LeBron James last year in Cleveland? I don't know because I think free agency, I think there's points where a guy is pretty convinced he's going to go one way or another. Like last summer, he may have been convinced I'm going to go somewhere else or, and then he ch- guys change their minds so much. They just do anybody who has a big decision typically changes their mind. You go through it and things change in a, in a place that might look appealing to him last summer may look less appealing by July 2nd or July 3rd. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just wouldn't rule out anything with him. He could stay in Cleveland on a short deal again. He could do another. Let's say he doesn't see anything out there that really makes sense. Does he just do another one-year deal in Cleveland? Mm. Uh, I I just I won't pretend to speculate on, mm. but I know this. Cleveland is preparing as if he's going to leave. Mm. I mean, that's a fact. They did that trade with Boston under the assumption he's not going to stay. Now, that doesn't mean, but as an organization, you have to plan for that. That doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean you're not trying to keep him. But I don't think they want to be left in wreckage when he goes. I think they want to be able to feel like they can pivot in some directions. And that's why now they're hesitating. You know, they've talked about George Hill and a deal with Sacramento. Well, he's got a $19 million figure next year. And if LeBron leaves and they tear this thing down in Cleveland, they're going, do we, you know, are we stuck with his? Do we have to pay that next year? Mm-hmm. Can we? And so I think they're measuring taking back money going forward and, mm-hmm. And those are all issues they've got to deal with. Do you see the Boston Celtics standing pat or trying to make a move to buffer their squad, I, knowing how vulnerable Cleveland appears to be right now? I think Boston is trying to get some complimentary players. I don't think there's a big wholesale deal for Boston. I think Boston is trying to help their bench, uh, maybe get some more offense in there. I think you know Tyreek Evans from Memphis, yeah. a lot of teams with interest playing in well him, this year. playing really well. Um, they would also love to get some size and rebounding, but I think anything they do, I think will be around their core. I don't know that there's going to be a, I don't think they're in the market. I haven't sensed they're in the market Mm -hmm. for a big wholesale change. A couple of quick items that I need to get with you before you get on out of here. Kawhi Leonard, that's something else you reported. Something going on between him and the San Antonio Spurs in terms of his rehab. He's not satisfied with it. We know his uncle is the heir, is, is, is the heir that, you know, he, he, you know, that, that's the guy that's in his ears rather. What's going on with San Antonio and Kawhi Leonard right now? Because Jalen Rose came on first take talking about Kawhi Leonard wants out of San Antonio. What can you tell us? Well, I, I just know that there's a lot of tension. There's a disconnect there between, uh, Kawhi and the organization. There's some repairing that needs to go on with the relationship. Will that become easier once he's healthy and back on the floor and playing at a high level? I think San Antonio hopes that. Um, but, you know, Kawhi is not a real communicative person. The, the, the player people see in public, very reserved, quiet, is largely the player behind the scenes. He, so I think that's a challenge at times too with him. But San Antonio has a history of being able to bridge relationships. They aren't a team without a history of, of having issues, but they've always been able to deal with them, keep them internal, and, and keep the guys they want together. They made it work with LaMarcus Aldridge when it wasn't going great. Um, so I, I still like their chances of figuring this out because I, I think Kawhi Leonard's about winning, and I still think they can find ways here to put pieces around them and, 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 and keep going as Ginobili and Parker mm-hmm. now 
spade toward retirement. Real quick, why is Jason Kidd going as coach of the Milwaukee Bucks? Uh, underachieving this year in the eighth seed right now when they thought they'd be fighting for a top four seed. And, and I just think a new general manager in Milwaukee, John Horst, uh, who replaced the GM, John Hammond, who didn't hire Jason. He was hired by ownership. I think they're gonna, they're giving John Horst a chance to hire his guy and put a GM in place who he feels, um, aligned with. Last question, Paul George and OKC. Trading deadlines approaching February 8th. I know he's not going anywhere before then, but in the same breath, uh, Oklahoma City's gotta lure him in, make sure he wants to stay. How keen are they, are, are they on keeping him? And how keen is he on staying in OK City, OK, Oklahoma City, based well, on what you're hearing? O- Oklahoma City's determined to resign him, but they also knew this. He wouldn't be ready to decide by February 8th that his decision would be built around how deep do we go in the playoffs? How does this season finish? What do I think the hope is? What can they do with the trade deadline to maybe improve the team? And I think he's kept an open mind on this the whole year. I know he has an open mind. He's enjoyed his time in Oklahoma City. I think it's important for him to try to win with this group. He wants to win have a team here that can go deep in the playoffs and then evaluate everything going into free agency. Adrian Wojnarowski right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Appreciate the great work as always, buddy. Thanks so much. Honored to have you in studio with me, buddy. Uh, honored to be in here, Stephen. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> I right. love it. Woj in the house with Stephen A. We'll be talking to him in the future. Make no mistake about that. You're listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. Back with your calls and more in a minute. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it. Welcome back to the Stephen A. Smith Show right here on ESPN Radio. Hour number two. I got more coming. I got more coming. Because like I said, and thanks again to Adrian Wojnarowski for coming on the show, Ultimate NBA Insider, doing our outstanding job for the network here for the family. We don't miss much, if anything at all, when it comes to that man. Doesn't miss anything at all. Very, very proud to have him here. Here's the deal. Getting back to the conversation that I was having. Understand, white America, I'm not talking about you. Not talking about you at all. Has nothing to do. You, you know, it's not about you. All these players, you understand? Talk about. I mean, everything you want to talk about. You understand? President Trump doesn't want somebody to come to the White House. We got something to say. Folks killing one another in the streets of Chicago. We waited a while to come to that to come to that situation, but we got something to say, and rightfully so. Other social issues related to Colin Kaepernick. Don't get me started. Oh, we had something to say about that. Black coaches getting fired. Nobody got nobody got anything to say. Nothing. Fisdale fired in Memphis. They went to the playoffs last year. Fired. Watson and Phoenix. Young talent. You ain't giving much to work with. Fired. He got fired before he had an opportunity to pass gas. And now you got a situation here where, okay, it's Jason Kidd. You got the Greek freak, Giannis Antetokounmpo, coming to the defense of Jason Kidd, calling him before the team even called him, said they're about to fire you. Do I need to call my agent? What do? What can I do to help you keep your job? Black folks with all of these Twitter accounts, all these Facebook accounts, all these Instagram accounts don't have a damn thing to say. This man. Giannis Antetokounmpo, the Greek freak. He's from Greece. Greece. And got more to say than some of these dudes. And, oh, by the way, in case y'all didn't notice, I said over 70%. Let me be specific. A report based in 2017, 74.4% of all NBA players are African-American or black. And if you take into account People of color, meaning international players, that number's up to 80.9%. Y'all ain't got nothing to say. 